I'm going to call to order the Industrial Education and Economic Development Finance and Policy Committee. And the clerk will take the roll. Representative Pulowski. Pulowski present. Representative Pulowski present. Representative Sandell. Representative Keel. Keel present. Representative Keel present. Representative Bierman. Present. Representative Bierman present. Representative Bliss. Present. Representative Bliss present. Representative Burkle. Burkle present. Representative Burkle present. Representative Frazier. Present. Representative Frazier present. Representative Hamilton. Present. Representative Hamilton present. Representative Liss Lagarde. Present. Representative Liss Lagarde present. Representative McDonald. Present. Representative McDonald present. Representative Sandstead. Representative Sandstead's presenting a bill in another committee. She'll join us when it's finished. Okay. Uh, Representative Sundin. Present. Representative Sundin present. We do have a quorum. Thank you. Representative Sandell, do you have a motion for us? Uh, Sandell is not present yet. I can see him on the screen, but- He didn't respond. He didn't, he didn't respond. He's doing something now. Chair Pulowski, this is Representative Mike Sundin. I've moved the minutes of the previous meeting. All right, minutes have been moved. Is there any discussion? Seeing no discussion, all those in favor of the motion, signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed, nay? Motion prevails, minutes are adopted. Members, we have a series of bills today from the uh, Public Facilities Authority. We're really staging these bills for a number of other committees. Uh, we've gone through this in the last legislative session and the uh, Public uh, Facilities Authority has its own ranking system where most of these will end up uh, in the uh, capital investment bill. So I'm going to be making a series of motions to where these bills will go, and uh, hopefully we will get through all of these today. So the first bill on the agenda is House File 1225, Representative Eklund. I'm going to move that House File 1225 be re-referred to the Ways and Means Committee. Representative Eklund, welcome to the committee and uh, present your bill. Thank you, Chair Pulowski, Vice Chair Sandell, and Lead Keel. I, I bring House File 1225 today for your consideration. This bill seeks to provide debt relief to the Crane Lake Water and Sanitary District located in my district in Northern Minnesota. In 2005, the Sanitary District was forced to take on over $1 million of additional debt for an unplanned modification of the direction of discharge of treated sewage flowing into the Vermilion River, which empties into Crane Lake, the Voyagers National Park, the Boundary Waters Canoe Area, and Quetico Provincial Park. The district and its ratepayers had no choice to but get a burdensome loan to pay for these sewer improvements. The total debt on the project of over $1.4 million has become unbearable for the small sewer district. Rates are sky high and are going up even more for the 135 rate taxpayers, or ratepayers, excuse me, Mr. Chair. It is unsustainable in, a, unsustainable in a small township with a small population like Crane Lake. With me today, Mr. Chair and members is Mr. Rob Scott, Chair of the Crane Lake Water and Sanitary District to provide further testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Uh, Chairman Scott, welcome to the committee. Please identify yourself for the record. Mr. Scott, I don't see Mr. Scott. Mr. Chairman, I don't see him either. Um, I, I can uh, just let the members know that this is a, a, a Community, 135 rate payers, they're doing their best to expand the sewer district. Representative Becklin, thank you. Uh, members, any discussion to the motion to re-refer this to Ways and Needs? Make it more. Representative Sandell, you are with us. I see your hand is up. Thank you, Mr. Chair and uh, Representative Eklund. I just have a general comment. I, I read the bills that are before committee today and, and uh, Representative Eklund is a uh, representative of, of each of those. I, I wonder uh, how these, um, um, how work on these projects is bid. Uh, is it restricted to um, uh, 
union contractors. I'm not going to vote against the bill if it's not. I'm just curious about it. Thank you. Representative Eklund. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Sandell, um, it goes out for, for general bids, but on with as with all government pro, uh, projects, there's a uh, prevailing wage and that sort of thing. So, so we get we do get good contractors. I can't tell you whether they're always union contractors or not, but they uh, uh, it's it's quality work that's done. Representative Sandell. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and Mr. Eklund, uh, and Representative Eklund. I've, uh, I've been on Kick Crane Lake and can't wait to vote yes on this project. Representative Eklund, I, I see you're in your office and yet you're breaking up. Are you using uh, the uh, Wi Fi connection or are you hardwired in? I don't think I'm using Wi Fi connection, Mr. Chair. Yeah, Representative Eklund, you, you broke up there too, so. Just as an uh, FYI for members, if you are in the state office building, you may be having some difficulties as some of our uh, members have in greater Minnesota. Uh, any further discussion to the bill? Seeing no further discussion, I'm gonna renew my motion that House File 1225 be re-referred to the Ways and Means Committee. Clerk will take the roll. Representative Pulowski. Pulowski votes aye. Pulowski votes aye. Representative Sundell. Aye. Representative Sundell, aye. Representative Keel. Aye. Representative Keel, aye. Representative Bierman. Aye. Representative Bierman, aye. Representative Bliss. Aye. Representative Bliss, aye. Representative Burkle. Aye. Representative Burkle, aye. Representative Frazier. Aye. Representative Frazier, aye. aye. Repres Representative Hamilton. Aye. Representative Hamilton, aye. Representative Lissagard. Aye. Representative Lissagard, aye. Representative McDonald. McDonald, aye. Representative McDonald, aye. Uh, Representative Sandstead. Not sure if she's in already. Representative Sundin. Aye. Representative Sending aye. We have eight, um, 11 ayes, no nays. 11 ayes, no nays. Motion prevails and the bill is on its way to ways and means. Members, I'm going to request that if you don't have your video on, and I can understand given the variety of uh, broadband width we have, uh, that's fine. But when you're voting, if you could say your name before you vote, just for the record, so we know it is you voting. Um, so thank you if you would do that on the rest of the bills. Uh, the next bill on the agenda is House File 1701. I'm going to move that House File 1701 be re referred to the Ways and Means Committee. And with that, Representative Nash, welcome to the committee and please present your bill. Good morning, Mr. Chair and members. Thank you for having 1701 before you this morning. Um, it is a request to add 20 million to PFA or the Public Facilities Authority to handle point source implementation grants for various cities around the state of Minnesota. It is a vital tool that we use to help cities uh, across Minnesota. And I have one testifier with me, Mr. Chair, and he is uh, very emblematic of what this would go to do. I have the mayor of Watertown, Mr. Steve Washburn, and uh, he is in the Zoom call and would be happy to testify. Thank you. Uh Mayor Washburn, welcome to the committee. Please identify yourself for the record. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, for the record, my name is Steve Washburn, Mayor of the City of Watertown. And do you wish to say anything about the bill? Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you, um, rest of the committee members. Um, as, as Mr. Nash, Representative Nash said, these are very important um, bills for small communities like the City of Watertown. City of Watertown is about 4,600 people. We're located on the Crow River and our, um, you know, basically output from our wastewater treatment facility goes directly into the Crow River. Um, the problem that we have is we're emitting too much phosphorus based on the new um, Minnesota pol uh, pollution control standards. So we need to up update our plant. That's a very expensive project for a small community like us. Um, we did just get bids. Um, like to share with uh, the committee how those bids worked out. Um, we initially thought this project could be implemented. We've been planning this project for a number of years. We thought it could be implemented um, 
as short as just a year ago for about $14 million. This project is now closer to $25 million. And obviously that's a big swing for a small community like ours. So these investing in these things from the, the state level is very important for small communities to keep our um, communities affordable and also to protect our environment. So I really appreciate the consideration for these things. Of, of course, I could go on more, but I, I don't need to talk just to talk. So I will ask you, Mr. Chair, if you were yourself, yourself or anyone else on the committee has any questions for me. Thank you, Mayor Washburn. Now, members of the committee, does anyone have any questions for either the author of the bill or Mayor Washburn? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm trying to find my hand here. Representative yeah, Hamilton. Right. Uh, Representative Hamilton. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Representative Nash, is this enough money to cover all the costs of the needs across the state. Representative Nash. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to my uh, my friend, Representative Hamilton. No, uh, but I think through a series of bills that the chairman has before him today that uh, there are some opportunities to add to the, to the pool of resources that cities like Watertown or cities in your own district will need. But uh, I think in a time like this, uh, handling physical infrastructure projects like this are very, very important for our state. Yeah. Representative Hamilton. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Representative Nash, uh, we had our mayors up last week and county commissioners to the Capitol. And uh, every single one of them brought up the need for um, monies to fund projects similar to this one. And that's why I ask. And with a over a $9 billion budget surplus, I'm wondering if we shouldn't make the investment now to make sure that these uh, projects are financed. So that's... Uh, my only comments, I guess. Thank you, Representative Nash. Um, members and Representative Hamilton, the uh, purpose of this hearing is to illustrate your point on the need, bill by bill, by project. That's why we're hearing the bills today. So thank you for bringing it up. Representative Sundin. Representative Sundin, you're muted. Well, I don't know how that happens all the time. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, you know, uh, the state... Uh, uh, regulates how much uh, phosphorus uh, content you can have in the, these releases. They mandate a lot of things. We, as a state, mandate a lot of things, be it uh, phosphorus content or the closer, closing of uh, jails uh, and, and other facilities uh, that are outdated. So, you know, I, I think it's about time we start putting our money where our mouth is. When we mandate things, we should be funding them. Thank you. All right, and there's a Representative McDonald, I, I'm not sure how you're, oh, it's Joe, uh, that's your Joe's photo. Okay, I've got it now. Representative McDonald, I couldn't identify you by the, uh, the identification, but when you flip down the screen, I definitely could. Representative McDonald. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, uh, hello to the mayor of Watertown, my original hometown. Uh, good to see you. Uh, I'm not too far from you right now. Anyway, question regarding the, uh, the new uh, standards by the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency regarding the reed beds. And the fragmites. Uh, do you does Watertown currently use uh, the rebed technology, Mayor Washburn? Um, Mr. Chair, uh, Representative McDonald, uh, it's a little too technical for me. We do have some other colleagues on the call as well. I don't know if our utilities superintendent could could answer that, but I, I do believe in addition to the phosphorus, we also have some solid um, some new solid standards. So if those fit into that, and um, Mr. Chair, I don't know if. Uh, um, the city administrator from the city of Watertown was able to join on the call, but um, I believe he does have our utility superintendent, which might be able to answer that question for Mr. Mr. Mc Representative McDonald. Representative McDonald and Mayor Washburn, I think I see these uh, water utility superintendents. So welcome to the committee and please identify yourself for the record. Good morning. My name is Doug Kamer from the city of Watertown, the utility superintendent. Um, no, we do not use reed beds as, as uh, uh, for solids. Why is to take the phosphorus out? Um, currently, we are using what they call geotubes. It takes, removes all the water and then we land apply it. Representative McDonald. Okay, thank you uh, for that information. Well, the reason I asked is I wanted to follow up to Representative, Representative Hamilton's that I don't think that the, we are putting enough money into this uh, program for our cities to be able to um, adjust to the uh, Minnesota Pollution Control Agency's uh, requirements for phosphorus discharge and then also the fragmites, I believe, if I'm terming that correctly, with reed beds, which are now uh, considered an AIS. 
aquatic invasive species because they're I think their leaves uh, or their byproducts spread and blow away and spread. So that is changing as well. So there will be a big need to put more money into this program for grants for our cities. And uh, I support Representative Hamilton's and uh, the efforts that are here to do so going forward. Uh, so I just wanted to uh, make that statement and then give a good old call out and hello to my friend, the mayor of Watertown. Okay, thank you. Any further discussion to the bill? And Representative Bierman, I, uh, Representative Bierman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, I just also wanted to chime in on the uh, extreme need across the state of Minnesota, whether it's for these wastewater projects or lead pipes or a lot of the infrastructure that has been neglected or whose time has come to be replaced. And this is the year to do that, whether we do it in uh, piecemeal projects like this, where we're uh, uh, supporting one thing, but we, we need to build on that momentum to have a robust bonding bill as well. As people have mentioned, we have this surplus, we have a high credit rating. Uh, now is not the time to skimp on these projects. And so I'm supporting this, this project in Watertown. I have friends out there as well. And I did want to ask the mayor, what would be the ramifications if this did not pass? Um, mayor Washburn. Um, Mr. Chair, Representative, well, um, this project has to proceed right now because our permit is uh, it's a condition of our permit from the MPCA. So um, we have to do it one way or the other. If it doesn't pass, though, we're going to see um, rates increase beyond what are forecasted. We've been, again, putting money aside. We got lots of money put aside, but, you know, we can't we can't put that all aside. So it's a double effect that's occurring. Not only do the price go up, the cost of the cost of bonding is going to go up for us, too. Right. Even though we're a well um well well financed city it's still going to be more expensive so it would be a major impact to our our residents as not a surprise to everybody we got a lot of senior citizens in our community living on fixed income so it's a little bit of a challenge so we would really appreciate the support Representative. yes thank you mr mayor thanks for being here thanks for speaking to us about it today and uh, you exhibit uh, just the need across the state. And I think that's the job of the legislature is to, the job of government essentially is to be able to help people across the state with the means to make it affordable and make those adjustments as we can as a community. So thanks for being here. Representative McDonald, your hand is still up. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just one last thing I wanted to uh, thank uh, Representative Nash for bringing this uh, forward, this bill forward. And as the mayor said, uh, they represent many senior citizens that are on a fixed income. One of those is my mother and uh, many relatives in the Watertown area. So uh, very important bill uh, personally and uh, for the folks of Watertown. And uh, thanks, Representative Nash, for your good work on this. And I uh, wish you all the best. Any further discussion? Seeing no further discussion, Representative Nash, last word. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. As the mayor of a small town before I joined the legislature, small towns ask for almost nothing from the legislature. This is an important thing that we are asking for for the uh, city of Watertown and cities like them. So uh, with that, Mr. Chair, thank you so much for having this bill before you. With that, members, I'm going to renew my motion that House Bill 1701 be referred to the Ways and Means Committee. Clerk will take the roll. Representative Pulaski. Pulaski votes aye. Representative Pulaski votes aye. Representative Sandel. Sandel votes aye. Representative Sandel aye. Representative Keel. Keel votes aye. Representative Keel aye. Representative Bierman. Bierman aye. Representative Bierman aye. Representative Bliss. Bliss aye. Representative Bliss aye. Representative Burkle. Burkle aye. Representative Burkle aye. Representative Frazier. Fraser I. Representative Fraser I. Representative Hamilton. Hamilton I. Representative Hamilton I. Representative Liz Lagarde. Representative Liz Lagarde I. Representative Liz Lagarde I. Representative McDonald. McDonald I. Representative McDonald I. Representative Sandstead. Representative Sundin. Sundin I. Representative Sundin, I. We have 11 ayes, zero nays. With a vote of 11 to zero, House File 1701 is on its way to Ways and Means. Next bill on the agenda is House File 3525. I am going to 
make a motion that House File 3525 be referred to Ways and Means. Representative Johnson, welcome to the committee and please identify yourself for the record and present your bill. Uh, Chair Pawlowski, my name is Representative Brian Johnson from House District 32A. I'm here representing the city of Bram uh, with a infrastructure bill dealing with uh, water, sewer, and some street issues. Um, the city of Bram is a population less than 2,000 with a high water table. Uh, with, uh, 80, with the system that they have is 85% of it is 60 plus years old, much of it built during the uh, WPA time. Uh, the city is, uh, needs some assistance. It's a 25% uh, of the population is below the uh, poverty line. And without assistance of uh, the close to $11.5 million, it would cost each citizen of Bram almost five thousand for a family of four almost five thousand dollars a year to do this project, which is desperately needed. With the high water table and the old clay pipes, a lot of infiltration into the sewer system, plus a lot of infiltration getting into the groundwater that needs to be repaired. Um, I do have some testifiers here on this day. One thing with the uh, 11.49 million, it is a matching grant and the funds are not available until it is verified that the funds have been matched. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to a couple of testifiers. I believe one of them is Linda Wolf, the city administrator from Bram. And I'm not sure if uh, uh, Bram superintendent, uh, Ken Gauger is gonna speak as well, but they are both here today. All right, Linda Wolf, uh, welcome to the committee. Please identify uh, yourself for the record and then uh, give us your testimony. Um, thank you, uh, Representative Pulowski. I appreciate being heard before the committee today. Uh, we were gonna have Ken Gagner speak first today. Um, Ken Gagner is the president of our Chamber of Commerce and also our school district superintendent. Um, so Ken, are you available? I am. Oh, there he is. All right. Mr. Gagner, uh, welcome to the committee and please identify yourself for the record. Uh, Ken Gagner, I'm the <clears throat> superintendent of schools here in Bram and also the chamber president. Go ahead. Uh, present your testimony, please. Well, thank you for giving me this opportunity. So I've been superintendent here in Bram for seven years now and chamber president for three years. Um, as Representative Johnson said, Bram's a community of about 1,800 um, about 25% of those folks are, are below the poverty level. And we're, uh, uh, some of you might, might know the, the lobbying group C, Schools for Equity and Education. We're one of those districts that falls in that category, uh, meaning basically that our taxpayers, our homeowners, pay, pay most of the taxes in the district. We're very, uh, as far as any businesses, it's, it's mainly homeowners. So that cost does fall on them. Um, you know, in a, in a greater capacity than it does in some other districts. And so, but what I, what I wanted to say about Bram is it's a very supportive community. Uh, our school district just went out for a bond on February 8th uh, for nearly $11 million to invest in the two school buildings. And that bond passed uh, with a 90% approval. Uh, so, so the people here want to support, uh, you know, their community. And uh, with that, investment uh, really and, and I look at it as an investment because what it allowed you know what we told our taxpayers is that you know you invest in our two buildings which are one was built in the 60s and the others in the early 70s um, is that by investing now you know you can really extend the life of those buildings and, it, and it's really a prudent use of taxpayers and that's a lot about this project as well uh, it's an investment in the basic infrastructure of the town and the town's growing um, you know, it has the potential to grow. I'm sure a lot of you saw in the paper, Isani County, uh, the cities of Isani and Cambridge are, are one in two in new building starts. And Bram is just a little bit further north, about 12 miles north of Cambridge, uh, and, and has that potential, you know, with working from home and so on, um, to, to grow and, and that economic development, and that's more taxpayers on the rolls and, and good for all of us. So it is a supportive community. Um, uh, we do good things here. Uh, I know this is the Industrial um, Education Committee. Uh, we did, you might have also noticed, we have the, the National Teacher of the Year in our career in tech ed programming. 
Um, so um, we're doing some good things out here and, and right now enrollment is stable. Uh, in fact, it's, it's growing a little bit in the district and, and we need a healthy community for that because again, in small towns, it goes hand in hand. And so this is a good project, it's basic infrastructure. And as Representative Johnson alluded, you know, without some, some support, it's gonna be really tough on our taxpayers. So with that, if there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Uh, otherwise, I'll turn it over to Linda. Thank you. Why don't we uh, go to Ms. Wolf. Ms. Wolf, welcome to the committee and uh, please present your testimony. All right, thank you. My name is Linda Wolf. I am the city administrator for the city of Graham and also joined behind me is Mayor Patricia Carlson, the fine mayor of Graham. Um, so more than 80% of the city's wastewater collection system is crumbling clay tile, which has exceeded its service life. The city has many water mains which date back to 1939 and are cast iron with lead fittings. Our facilities lack modern automation, which drives unnecessarily high labor costs. The city suffers five to six water main breaks per year and one or two sewer line collapses per year. These cost the city even more in emergency repairs. Part of our funding request is to for a new well. Our current backup well is not equipped to provide adequate water to the entire city as it pumps less than half the gallons per minute that our main well pumps. Additionally, that water is untreated and very high in manganese. If our primary well were to go down, we would not be able to provide enough water for fire suppression and maintain the required city pressure. Uh, as part of our $11.49 million request, what we are doing is we were replacing uh, water and sewer pipes underground. And there are great economies of scale doing those projects together because they're in the same trench and you do not have to dig the streets up twice. The unfortunate part for Bram is we have a limited industrial tax base to kind of help share the burden of this. So a majority of this is going to fall on our homeowners. Um, our current water bills, um, are $88 per month for 5,000 gallons, which the state uses at an average. Um, without state help, that's gonna swell to $157 per month uh, by 2030. So the total project cost is 22.98 million. We are asking for 11.49 million, and I will stand for any questions that you have. All right. Mayor Carlson, it's uh, nice to have you at the committee hearing too. Thank you for attending. Members, do we have any uh, questions? Seeing no questions, Representative Johnson, last word. I just want to thank the uh, committee for uh, considering this. It is a huge priority in my district. I, I've actually worked on the sewer lines there when I lived and uh, worked for the city of Bram as a police officer. I, had done sewer and water work uh, before I was hired as a police officer, so I understood it and I assisted the city crews repairing them. Uh, and that was 30 plus years ago, and the lines still need to be replaced. It's just the, uh, the overall cost it, it is just overbearing on the citizens, citizens of Bram, and uh, assistance is desperately needed. So I want to thank you for considering this bill. Thank you. All right, thank you. Seeing no further discussion, I'll renew my motion that House File 3525 be referred to Ways and Means. Clerk will take the roll. Representative Pulaski. Pulaski votes aye. Representative Pulaski, aye. Uh, Representative Sundell. Sundell votes aye. Representative Sundell, aye. Representative Keel. Keel, aye. Representative Keel, aye. Representative Bierman. Bierman, aye. Representative Bierman, aye. Representative Bliss. Bliss, aye. Representative Bliss, aye. Representative Burkle. Burkle, aye. Representative Burkle, aye. Representative Frazier. Frazier, aye. Representative Frazier, aye. Representative Hamilton. Hamilton, aye. Representative Hamilton, aye. Representative Liss Lagarde. Representative Liss Lagarde, aye. Representative Liss Lagarde, aye. Representative McDonald. McDonald, aye. Representative McDonald, aye. Representative Sandstead. Sandstead, aye. Representative Sandstead, aye. Representative Sundin. Sundin, aye. Representative Sundin, aye. 
uh, 12 ayes, 0 nays. With a vote of 12 to 0, the motion prevails. The bill is on its way to ways and means. Next bill on the agenda is House File 3674. I'm going to make the motion to refer to ways and means. Representative Haley, welcome to the committee and uh, please present your bill. Good morning, Chair Pulowski and members. Thank you for the opportunity to talk with you this morning about 3674. Uh, similar to the other bills that you've heard this morning, this is for a uh, wastewater treatment uh, facility. Uh, the four communities that have joined together in this project are Goodyear, Pine Island, Wanamingo, and Zambroda. And similar to uh, other small towns who have talked this morning, uh, these projects are beyond the means of communities um, this size. And that therefore we are seeking state support. Uh, all of these communities are operating outdated and deteriorating sanitary facil facilities uh, mixed with the high operational costs that they have, uh, increased uh, fees for permit discharge and are facing you know, pollution into the Zumbro River. So similar story, as I said, uh, to other communities and we're so appreciative of your time this morning. I'd like to turn it over to uh, two of my testifiers, uh, the engineer on the project and the mayor of Pine Island, uh, David Fries. Do you want the uh, city engineer first, Representative I, I believe so, thank you, Mr. Chair. Right. Yeah. Bill Angerman, are you here? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, this is Bill Angerman. I'm the city engineer for the city of Zambroda and actually uh, Mayor Fries will, will, will go first, but thank you. <laughs> All right, Mayor Fries, welcome to the committee. Please identify yourself for the record and present your testimony. Good morning, uh, Chair Pulowski. My name is David Fries. I am the mayor of Pine Island and good morning to the other committee members. We are here today to propose a project we are very passionate about. And what we are looking at doing is seeking some support to move forward with this project. I believe what we're doing this morning is providing a solution to a problem. What we have before you today are the uh, communities of Goodyear, Pine Island, Wanamingo, and Zambroda. And these four half gallons of chocolate milk represent the treatment plants that we have in our communities. And what we are wanting to do is take these four different regional treat or four treatment plants and we want to combine them into one treatment plant. Not only is this going to be economically friendly to everyone, but it's also going to be environmentally impactful and is also going to be more efficient as we are gonna be bring the four different treatment plants where we're having to multiply every, everything times four. And we wanna bring that into one regional treatment plant. Hey, Representative Pulaski, this is Bill Angerman again. And as the Mr. mayor Anger. said, oh, thank, thank you. As sure. the mayor said, uh, as we were looking at the engineering side of this and what we looked at was if the four communities stayed on their own, what would be their capital costs? And the, the cost to construct four individual plants to address, again, the phosphorus and nitrogen limits that are being placed upon our communities, uh, the cost was uh, very similar. So we could come and ask for four $20 million projects, or we could combine together and reduce our long-term operation and maintenance costs. Our long-term operation maintenance costs would be reduced by over a half million dollars per year which is really significant uh, for the size of our communities. I uh, want to talk also a little bit about, you know, the creation of a sanitary district. That is something that we have not seen in Southeast Minnesota for over 30 years. And one of the things that our mayors and our uh, city administrators has asked, well, why is that? And a lot of that is because uh, the funding, the previous funding sources in the 70s and 80s into the early 90s was the federal government through the EPA grant program uh, financed approximately 90% of the wastewater treatment plant costs. So we saw regionalization. We saw some of this um, combining of resources. And what we really think is for the state of Minnesota and for all of our communities, this is something we need to really uh, look at and really uh, funding is really uh, essential to that. Uh, without as some of the other testifiers earlier have mentioned the, the sewer bills and costs, and, and we are projecting that without funding, uh, we would have sewer, sewer bills alone, not counting water and other city utilities, would be a, approximately $180 per month uh, for, for an average home. So again, a, a big financial impact. Uh, we did have a few slides, uh, uh, Mr. Chair, that we would like to share if that, if that is all right. Uh, did you send those to uh, Mr. Worth or are you going to present? Uh, Mr. Worth had uh, said we, we would be able to share our screen, so I hopefully right. that, that will work. So, 
If you are, if you're ready, please uh, present them. All right. Thank you. Okay. So, so one of the things we just wanted to make sure we know, knew where we were at. So the four communities uh, represented on our map here are all about seven miles apart. So in essence, this project, we would pump our wastewater from the four communities or from the three communities to a central point in Zambroda where we would build a new regional treatment facility. And again, the emphasis of this is to replace our old outdated treatment facilities, but again, to also to address our new uh, permit limits. Okay, next slide. And then, um, and then just to summarize that, you know, again, our engineering analysis it is the most cost of long-term solution. And again, you know, as we're thinking about this, as, as uh, Mayor Freeze had said, we're, right now we're doing everything in uh, sets of four, meaning we have four discharges into the Zumbro River. We have four sets of operators. We have four sets of building. Uh, we do everything four times. And again, uh, we just, again, just to drive home that point, uh, uh, for all the things you see on the screen, it's, it's just, it, it really is the best long-term solution. And then our last slide, uh, you know, again, uh, what our, our, our project cost is uh, $70 million. Uh, actually, when we met with the Office of MMB, they did add inflation to our number, so that $84 million. That is a large project. We really understand that. Uh, but it's either that or we would come with four $20 million projects. So. We are trying to, our, our intent is that we are trying to do something that, that hasn't been done in many years and, and we really think uh, benefits our communities. So uh, with that, Mayor Freeze, uh, anything? Uh, Mr. Chair, yeah. to add to, I'm sorry. Mr. Mayor, I'm just yes, identifying Mr. yourself for the record, Mr. Mayor, that's all right. All right, no. yes, Mayor. Please proceed. I'm sorry, Mr. Chair. What we also have with us too is uh, our. We have the uh, Prairie Island Indian community who recently purchased land next to Pine Island that would also potentially be a part of this project as well. All right. Anything else, gentlemen, from either one of you? Uh, no, thank you. I am familiar with the city of Zambroda. My father was a golf professional at your golf course in the early 1970s, and I was in college, and I helped him redesign one of your greens. As I recall, it was at about a 45 degree angle, and we made it playable so it could hold a golf shot. So if you play the golf course next time, you'll recognize the green that's been made much more playable for members. Any other questions from any members of the committee? Seeing none, Representative Haley, last word. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I think the uniqueness of this proposal is the combination of four communities working together. And that could serve as a really good um, pilot test project for the rest of the state. We will be facing um, uh, this need across all of our rural districts in the coming years. And the opportunity to have a combined project that would save long-term costs I think is something the state should take a hard look at. And I'm just, I'm proud of these communities for being creative in their proposal and coming together to, to work on it. So thank you committee members uh, for allowing us to present today. And thank you, Mr. Chair, for the time. Uh, you're welcome. With that, I'll renew my motion that House File 3674 be re-referred to the Ways and Means Committee. The clerk will take the roll. Representative Pulowski. Pulowski votes aye. Representative Pulowski, aye. Representative Sundell. Representative Sandel, oh, sorry. Representative Sandel, aye. Representative Keel. Keel, aye. Representative Keel, aye. Representative Bierman. Representative Bliss. Bliss, aye. Representative Bliss, aye. Representative Burkle. Burkle, aye. Representative Burkle, aye. Representative Frazier. Frazier, aye. Representative Frazier, aye. Representative Hamilton. Hamilton, aye. Representative Hamilton, aye. Representative Lissagard. Representative Lissagard, aye. Representative Lissagard, aye. Representative McDonald. McDonald, aye. Representative McDonald, aye. Representative Sunstead. Aye. Representative Sunstead, aye. Representative Sundin. Sundin, aye. Representative Sundin, aye. Representative Bierman. Bierman, aye. Representative Bierman, aye. 12 ayes, 0 nays. With a vote of 12 to 0, House File 3674, the motion prevails. It's on its way to Ways and Means.
Next bill on the agenda is House File 3712. I will make the motion to re-refer it to Ways and Means. Representative Tice, uh, please present your bill. Thank you, Chair Pulowski. It's really good to see you. And thank you to the members for hearing this bill. I'm really excited because St. Augusta is one of those wonderful communities that is frugal and does what they should. And in fact, uh, I, this bill that's coming before us today most likely is coming because we expect a, a larger population in St. Augusta in the coming years. And I say hallelujah to that because we all know that we have a lack of housing, uh, especially workforce housing. So with that, I'm just going to turn it over to Mayor Zenzen of St. Augusta and also the city manager, Bill McCabe. I believe Bill might just be here for questions, but uh, who knows? Thank you. All right, Mayor Zenzen, welcome to the committee. Please identify yourself for the record and present your testimony. Good morning, representatives. I'm Michael Zenzen, the mayor of the city of St. Augusta. We are a city of about approximately 3,500 people with about half of those people being served by sewer and water. We are a comparatively different city from most is that our city with a small population covers 30 square miles. Uh, we put in a city sewer and water system back in 2003 and that has brought us into more growth and brought in a lot of young families. We were a kind of a stagnant population before that to where it was a lot of retired people. We we're a bedroom community, but with the addition of one of our developments, I believe it was about 90 houses, it was mostly new families that moved in. So it was good to see a lot of young people come in. But of course, with new families, everybody's looking at pennies. It's the same, well, we know seniors on fixed incomes, they're looking pretty, watching their pennies very closely, so are young families. Uh, our, this project will probably, the early estimate is about $9 million. And what happened when we originally put in sewer and water, we leased, we went into an agreement with the city of St. Cloud to buy water for them, but it was in our contract with them that we would eventually get our own water system. And now is the time for us to do that, especially looking at uh, budget surpluses and things like that. But like I say, uh, it's something we really need. We've been planning on it for a while. We've taken a few initial steps. We've already purchased property and put test wells in at a well site. And we purchased property for water tower. But now what we're seeking immediate in the immediate future right now is the funding for the planning portion of this project. So if you have any other questions, I'd be willing to try to answer them. Members, any questions? I don't see any questions. Representative Tice, do you have any further testimony? I do not. Then last word. Thank you, uh, Chair Pulowski. Um, I'm just really glad to be able to do this because one of the things we all know is the shortage of housing and the fact that St. Augusta has the room to grow and are coming forward asking for some help on this just to get the planning done so that we can go forward. Makes me very happy because uh, as the lead on, on housing, we all know this is a huge deal. So I wanna thank, um, St. Augusta for reaching out and I want to thank all our our members on the committee and Chair Pulowski for your support. All right thank you. I will then renew my motion that House File 3712 be re-referred to the Ways and Means Committee. The clerk will take the roll. Representative Pulowski. Pulowski votes aye. Representative Pulowski aye. Representative Sandell. Sandell votes aye. Representative Sandell aye. Representative Keel. Keel aye. Representative Keel, aye. Representative Bierman. Bierman, aye. Representative Bierman, aye. Representative Bliss. Bliss, aye. Representative Bliss, aye. Representative Burkle. Burkle, aye. Representative Burkle, aye. Representative Frazier. Frazier, aye. Representative Frazier, aye. Representative Hamilton. Hamilton, aye. Representative Hamilton, aye. Representative Bliss Lagarde. Representative Bliss Lagarde, aye. Representative Liz Lagarde, aye. Representative McDonald. McDonald, aye. Representative McDonald, aye. Representative Sandstead. Sandstead, aye. 
Representative Sunstead, aye. Representative Sundin. Sundin, aye. Representative Sundin, aye. 12 ayes, zero nays. With a vote of 12 to zero, House File 3712 has been re referred to Ways and Means. Next bill on the agenda is House File 4115. My motion will be to re refer this bill to the Health and Finance and Policy Committee. There's an element in the bill that they've requested to see. Representative Jordan, I don't, do I see her? Hi, Mr. There, Chair. Representative Jordan, welcome to the committee and please present your bill. Well, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and good morning, members of the committee. I'm excited to present House File 4115 to you this morning, a bill to protect Minnesotans from exposure to lead in their drinking water through lead service lines. Lead service lines are one of the largest sources of lead in Minnesota's drinking water, and often lead service lines are both publicly and privately owned. Therefore, we must replace both parts simultaneously to avoid increasing lead concentration in drinking water. Lead exposure through drinking water is a statewide issue. Lead service lines are present across Minnesota in all communities, urban, suburban, and rural. However, lead exposure through service lines is most common in lower income communities. Unfortunately, there is not a comprehensive map of lead lines in Minnesota. This bill creates a state grant program for lead line removal administered by PFA funded at 30 million a year for 10 years. Municipalities and community water systems are eligible for grants to remove and replace lead service lines. At least 70% of the funds must be used to private to be used to remove the privately owned portions of the lines. Um, this bill prioritizes cities' water systems that have a plan to remove all lead lines and have identified how they will maximize participation from homeowners, including low income and other disadvantaged homeowners, and minimize partial removals. Large systems must also develop a workforce plan to maximize the use of apprentices and those underrepresented in the construction industry. Prevailing wage applies to construction work funded by this grant, and it creates a goal to remove all lead lines by 2032. Above all, House File 4115 seeks to minimize Minnesotans' exposure to lead in our drinking water. Not only will this bill improve our quality of life, but a report from the Minnesota Department of Health and the University of Minnesota in 2019 found that for every dollar spent on addressing lead in our drinking water, we would see at least $2 return in investment from better health outcomes. I have some testimony for us to listen to, Mr. Chair, and then I would be happy to stand for questions. Thank you. Uh, the first testifier I have is it Mayor Coates. That is correct, sir. Mayor Coates, uh, please identify yourself for the record and present your testimony. Thank you, Chairman Pulaski and uh, fellow members. My name is Myron Coates. I'm the mayor of Pipestone, Minnesota, which is in southwest Minnesota, if you're not familiar with the state, which I hope you all are. I'm only saying that tongue in cheek. Uh, Pipestone, like most communities in southwest Minnesota, were founded in the 1870s. And uh, in terms of numbers of buildings in our community, the majority were built uh, pre-World War II or right around the Korean War uh, time frame. And uh, these were all uh, built prior to any comprehensive uh, building codes or state building codes uh, that were any type of uh, building code adopted by the city. Uh, this area encompasses about 160 square blocks. Uh, records of sewer and water are mixed at best in this area. Uh, only if reconstruction of infrastructure had happened in the last number of years uh, with the complement uh, engineering that we have a pretty good idea what, what is in this area. So the question is, is, one, is on lead service lines in a community such as ours, how do we find them? Uh, basically, our, our only method, true method, would be to inspect all the houses and buildings within a 160 square block area. Um, physically look at it. If we could not determine that, uh, would have to be some exploratory digging to find the service lines. Uh, the replacement lines, uh, currently PFA provides about a 50-50 grant on a project basis, which I'll uh, refer to later as a as the cost of this. Uh, and, uh, and it also is located, uh, the, the number of homes in this area are typically your lower cost homes, so this is where our workforce is uh, located, which typically are not on your higher income uh, schedule. And so it's real important that we help them out as much as possible. If lines are not replaced during infrastructure uh, rebuild, uh, then we have to go back and do them individually. Uh, Pipestone estimates that we have somewhere between 225 and 300 lead service lines uh, in our city at a cost of about $2,500 to $3,000 each to replace. Uh, all lead lines need to be replaced, so the more financial support we can get, the better it will be. Uh, I just want to give you a quick example of uh, 
what happens during a project. And this is what we were dealt with this Monday night at our city council meeting. We uh, release plans and spec to do a rebuild of about a six square block area. And with and we know that there are lead lines in this area. Our building official owns a corner, corner lot and he paid $40,000 for this house originally. We looked at the projected 30% uh, assessment back for project cost on his home was be $35,000. And so the assessment is nearly as much as the home was originally worth. Uh, so now you throw in another $3,000 uh, uh, for the cost of lead line, service line replacement. It gets to be very costly for the people. Uh, so any help that we can get will be greatly appreciated by the, by the public and by the cities. Uh, that's what I have to say, Chairman Plowski. I'll entertain any questions if there are any. Uh, thank you, Mayor Coates. I think we'll go to the next uh, testifier, John Thorson, and then we'll see if there are any questions. And I know, Representative Hamilton, you've got a couple of amendments. We're going to get all the testimony in first. So, um, Mr. Thorson, welcome to the committee, and uh, please identify yourself and present your testimony. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, my name is John Thorson. I'm Legislative Director for Lyuna, Minnesota, and North Dakota. Uh, we're Minnesota's infrastructure union representing more than 13,000 skilled construction laborers who build and maintain our roads, highways, bridges, sources of energy and transmission, and the basic utilities that allow our communities to thrive. Uh, our recent investments in the 2020 Local Jobs and Projects Bill, along with uh, federal funding and the Bipartisan Infrastructure Investments and Jobs Act, together are a good foundation for critical down payment for addressing what is Minnesota's estimated $12.3 billion need for water infrastructure improvements over the next 20 years. A robust approach by this legislature can be a truly transformational investment in our state's future and put us on a path for remo removing the over 100,000 estimated lead lines that threaten our drinking water. Uh, we strongly support the provisions of House File 2650 that call for eliminating all lead service lines in our state by 2032 and would provide direct grant funding necessary to ensure that cities can map, that they can identify and replace both the public right of way and the private portions of lead service lines. Lyuna members are skilled in lead service line replacement and we take pride in working to help our own communities address drinking water needs and have worked on lead pipe replacements in many communities throughout the region. We collaborate with cities to leverage our expertise in our union training centers to accelerate the identification, elimination of these dangerous lead pipes in our communities. And our registered, registered apprenticeship programs are supporting critical efforts to increase participation of women, people of color, veterans, and other underrepresented groups in the construction workforce. Prevailing wage requirements guarantee living wages for local construction workers on many transportation, water, energy, and housing, and other building construction projects funded or financed with taxpayer dollars. Prevailing wages laws uh, ensure construction workers are a fair wage, and they lead to safer, higher quality work, and sta stability for local economies. Uh, the Minnesota Department of Labor and Industry sets prevailing wage rates to be comparable to wages paid for similar work in the county where the construction project is located. And the rates are determined through surveys of actual wages paid to construction workers in the local community. Uh, these requirements help ensure work is performed by skilled workers, minimizing the risk of lead contamination from improper removal, such as shaking lead uh, from one portion of the system into another. And research shows that prevailing wage does not increase the cost of these projects. Um, Layuna and the Minnesota Building Trades oppose any effort to weaken or repeal prevailing wage laws in our state. Um, we encourage your support of a multipath effort for making critical state investments, which will ensure that lead pipes are replaced and clean drink water is delivered to families and children across Minnesota to increase the health, social, and economic vitality of our entire state. Thank you. All right, at this point, members, I'm going to go to Representative Hamilton. You have two amendments. Which one do you want to present first? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to withdraw the A1 amendment and move the A2 amendment and speak to that one if I could, Mr. Chairman. All right, A1 is withdrawn. A2, uh, Representative Hamilton moves the A2 amendment. Representative Hamilton. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And this is to address prevailing wage. And I, I thank the testifier, Mr. Thorson. I've always enjoyed working with you in the past, and I, I thank you for your testimony as well. Um, just last week, I had the mayors up from southwestern Minnesota, 
And they were talking about their concerns around the way the prevailing wage is calculated because it does not directly um, uh, reflect what the wages are being paid in the counties. And I said, give me a specific example that I can share with the, the chairman and my colleagues. And um, it was the example in Worthington. And um, it's a little bit different because it's talking about housing. You also brought up housing and prevailing wage. The city of Worthington received an $868,000 um, uh, grant from DEED and they put in another $434,000 for a total of 1.3 million of quote, I'm gonna use their terminology, free money and they could not get a developer to build a 48 unit complex because when the developer took a look at what the prevailing wage was and the increased cost to that project, it drove up the square footage costs so high that it simply wouldn't cash flow. And um, I've had uh, friends in unions sit me down and explain to me how uh, the prevailing wage is calculated. And if there is not information uh, presented from the county, it moves to the next county, so on and so forth. So we have prevailing wages that more are in line and reflect wages that are paid in the metro area. And this doesn't work out in deep rural Minnesota. And just go back to my example, you're using Minnesota, or excuse me, metro area wages to build a complex that will receive Nobles County rent payments. And so instead of receiving about $1,300 or $1,400 a month for rent, you're receiving closer to six or $700 for rent. And so um, again, this is a project that did not happen because of prevailing wage. And so instead of getting a, a, a decent wage out in deep rural Minnesota, good living wage, you get no wage at all because the project is killed because of the way prevailing wage is calculated. And, um, and so uh, again, the mayors and county commissioners that were up last week said, Rod, this needs to change. And we've been talking about this for 18 years that I've been up here. And so we have to figure out either in deep rural Minnesota, eliminate prevailing wage or figure out a way to calculate prevailing wage to better reflect the wages in the geographical areas of the state. And so uh, that's why I'm bringing this amendment forward. I'm more than happy to stand for questions, Mr. Chairman. Representative Sundin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, is all I really have to say is au contraire. Uh, the calculation for Prevailing wages uh, was uh, misinterpreted by uh, uh, the representative. And to tell you the truth, when metro wages are uh, calculated and uh, the uh, surrounding counties uh, have similar wages, that, that's all well and fine. Out in rural Minnesota, let's say, let's use Cochiteen County or Lake of the Woods County, for instance, their wages are somewhat less than the metro area. The metro wages have nothing to do with uh, the remote counties. That's uh, that's a uh, misinterpretation of how things are calculated. I've done this type of work. I've talked to contractors throughout the state and done the surveys. And if contractors do actually uh, contribute the, their information, those wages are in fact calculated in for those counties. So. Uh, Oh, contraire. Thank you. Mr. Chairman. Um, hang Mr. on, Mr. Chairman. Hamilton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Au contraire, Representative Sundin. Au contraire, my dear friend. Uh, again, Worthington had to um, give back $868,000 back to Deed because of the prevailing wage calculation. And again, I'm not trying to discredit uh, the workers or anything like that. I'm simply saying that the way we calculate prevailing wage is killing projects in deep rural Minnesota. This is a, the perfect example of that. So now instead of having a job in Worthington to build this, uh, this um, apartment complex, there's no jobs at all. 
and they had to give back the $868,000 back to deed that will go to probably the metro area. Um, again, this is something that needs to be addressed, Mr. Chairman. And uh, that's why I bring this uh, amendment forward. I'd also like to say, since I have the floor, um, I am gonna support your bill, Representative Jordan. It's a good bill, we need to do it. But again, we need to address how the prevailing wage is calculated because it is killing projects out in deep rural Minnesota. Thank you. Representative Sundee. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'm gonna refer to a, a project that was in Cloquet, Minnesota, uh, a housing project where the uh, prevailing wage was in fact enforced on an out of state contractor and $1.7 million in wages and benefits uh, had to uh, be uh, disseminated amongst the craftsmen that worked on that project. So uh, proper enforcement of these uh, calculated, well calculated uh, wages is important for uh, crafts, craftsmen and women in Minnesota. Thank you. Representative McDonald. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, uh, prevailing wage, this was a concern of my father's back uh, when you served with him, uh, Representative Pulowski, in the uh, 70s and er uh, 80s and early 90s. Uh, he had uh, known that prevailing wage would rise the cost of all kinds of projects, courthouses, city halls, and especially our roads. Now it cost over a million dollars a mile to build a road. So prevailing wage is a, a sticky situation and uh, perhaps there is a good use for it. But in this particular case, I defer to uh, the au contraire representative Hamilton and the project in Worthington that happened. So I question for representative Jordan, in your testimony, you stated how important this is. And if certainly health wise, it certainly is important, especially in areas that are uh, low income uh, to ensure they get proper water and good health. Uh, what is, uh, are you concerned at all that prevailing wage uh, in your bill very well could have a modicum of a difference that some of this project will not take place and ensure the safety of uh, drinking water from your bill? Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Representative McDonald. Uh, no, I'm not concerned. I think that it's the prevailing wage is incredibly important, and in almost all cases, Minnesota requires prevailing wage for publicly funded infrastructure investments like this. And this would include private projects funded by deed. We also know that for certain federal matches, we need to make sure that we have prevailing wage. And we also know that there are strong prevailing wage components within PFA projects. So I'm not concerned that the prevailing wage provisions within my bill would prevent lead service lines from being removed. Representative McDonald. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, Representative Jordan. Well, I, I, I'm gonna support the bill, uh, but I'll uh, work for, hopefully on the House floor or Ways and Means, an amendment that, uh, that'll accept, maybe we'll accept uh, Representative Hamilton's amendment. Maybe you'll be, the board or the uh, committee will be wise enough to accept that uh, so we can ensure safe drinking water and uh, prevent any possibility of prevailing wage, wage prohibiting the project going forward. So I hope you'll consider this when voting on this, uh, Rod, uh, Representative Hamilton's important amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Bliss. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and actually, I have to agree with Representative Sundin on something. Uh, at the end of his initial statement, he said, if people report their wage, then it is calculated properly. And I agree with that. Um, the problem is that it's not always reported. Uh, I was a project manager on a large project in Northern Minnesota uh, where we had, it was a low voltage project that I was doing. Uh, the prevailing wage on the first project that I did was right around 30 bucks an hour for somebody pulling cable. Pulling cable. That was my <laughs> entry level position in, into the field. Now, you know, if you're in the metro area, that's a, a good union position, that's, that's a decent wage. When you're in Northern Beltrami County, that's more than a professional wage. Uh, the second job, the second project I had, same same type of work, the prevailing wage was seventeen eighty an hour, uh, about 18 months later. And I guess the, what happened was we had some more people in Beltrami County reporting the wages so it actually reflected the actual wage that these people should be earning. So Representative Sundin, you are correct. If, if people report the wages, it gets cal calculated correctly. But as Representative Hamilton said, that doesn't happen. And when it doesn't happen, $17.80 versus 
close to 30, that's, that's a huge difference. And that's a, that's a 50 or hundred percent increase in labor costs that, that will slow down these projects and, and representative Jordan, you know, I had to value engineer in my project to get down to a, so I could finish this project. I don't know how much value engineering you can do on a lead pipe removal project. Um, <laughs> I mean, that's, that's not feasible. So I guess, you know, I'm, I'm going to agree with representative Sundin and representative Hamilton. If the, we just need to recalculate the way these prevailing wages are done. I don't mind paying a livable wage, but a livable wage in Northern Beltrami County is far different than a livable wage in Minneapolis and St. Paul. Thank you. Representative Lewis, I got Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, I totally uh, respect my dear friend, uh, Mr. Hamilton. Uh, 100%, you are a kind, genuine man. And, uh, but I, I, I firmly disagree. Um, you know, in, in greater Minnesota, I want the, I want the wages to be there for the men and women who, uh, work and provide for us and for us to be having a conversation that we shouldn't, uh, people in greater Minnesota shouldn't get paid what they get paid in the, uh, the Minneapolis, uh, St. Paul area, um, to me is just totally disheartening. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I hear, and I, and I support it, right? So we talk about importing all of the, these metals and all of this to, to countries that don't have the same environmental or labor standards. And I hear this from my colleagues that some of them are on this, on this call on the Republican side. And I agree with you, but we should, on the same token, we should be paying the people. I don't care where you're at in the state of Minnesota. They should be able to earn a good living equal to anyone else. And to be even talking about greater Minnesota, we shouldn't have to pay as much or it should be adjusted to me is just exactly uh, the wrong direction where we need to go. And actually, frankly, it's disappointing that we're trying to lower the wages in greater Minnesota. So. Representative Bliss, your hand went back up. Is that? Yeah, I, I, yes, okay. Mr. Chair, I'd like to, to, to rebut something that was just said. Sure. You know, I agree with you. Representative Lizagard, we need to pay these people a good wage. Again, cost of living is not something the government sets. The government does not set and should not set wages. And that is exactly what we're doing right here. This is a free market society, whether you like it or not. And yes, in those minds, those are good jobs and they're gonna be good paying jobs, but the market should be setting that rate, not us in St. Paul. And again, I said that when the, the local economy sets the prevailing wage, it works. The problem is that it is not set at the local economy. And yes, the, the cost of living, <laughs> I've lived there for most of my life. The cost of living in Beltrami County is less than in Minneapolis. So yes, the prevailing wage will be less in Beltrami County. It doesn't mean that they get a lesser quality of life. It just means that it doesn't cost as much to rent an apartment, to go out to dinner. It, it, is, it, it is less in Northern Minnesota. So it is not the government responsibility to set these wages. It's the market's responsibility. Thank you. Representative Liz Lagarde and members, remember uh, we have one more bill after this one. So Representative Liz Lagarde. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll just, uh, I'll leave you at your own words that you're advocating to pay your people in your district lower wages than everyone else. And to me, that is just disheartening. I'll leave it there. All right, members, I'm gonna go Mr. to- Mr. Chairman, can I? Oh, I'm sorry. Representative Hamilton, just hang on. Representative Jordan, I would like your position on the amendment. Then I will go to Representative Hamilton for the last word on the amendment. Representative Jordan, on the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would ask members to oppose this amendment. Representative Hamilton. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And to my dear friend, Representative Liz Lagarde, I have the utmost respect for you as well. And thank you for the kind words. This isn't about um, lowering the wages in rural Minnesota. It is about whether or not you have a job or you don't have a job. Uh, that's the difference. And the way the prevailing wage is currently calculated does not work for deep rural Minnesota. That's why I brought this amendment forward. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Seeing no more discussion, all those in favor of the amendment signify by saying aye. 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 All those aye. opposed, nay. Nay. No. nay. Motion does not prevail. The amendment is not adopted. Representative Jordan, last word on your bill. I'm going to renew my motion that it be referred to health, finance, and policy. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, members, for the discussion today. It's a good bill, and I hope you're in your support. Clerk will take the roll. Representative Pulaski. Pulaski votes aye. Representative Pulaski, aye. Representative Sandell. Sandell votes aye. Representative Sandell, aye. Representative Keel. Keel, aye. Representative Keel, aye. Representative Beerman. Beerman, aye. Representative Beerman, aye. Representative Bliss. Bliss, aye. Representative Bliss, aye. Representative Burkle. Burkle, aye. Representative Burkle, aye. Representative Frazier. Frazier, aye. Representative Frazier, aye. Representative Hamilton. Hamilton, aye. Representative Hamilton, aye. Representative Liz Lagarde. Aye. Representative Liz Lagarde, aye. Representative McDonald. McDonald, aye. Representative McDonald, aye. Representative Sunstead. Aye. Representative Sunstead, aye. Representative Sundin. Sundin, aye. Representative Sundin, aye. We have 12 ayes, zero nays. With a vote of 12 to zero, House File 4115 is referred to the Health, Finance, and Policy Committee. Next bill on the agenda is House File 3858. Uh, this bill will be re-referred to the Capital Investment Committee. Representative Bolden, welcome to the committee and please present your bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and good morning, committee members. I'm grateful to be before you this morning with House File 3858. Protecting Minnesota's waters is something I imagine we can all agree on. Ensuring that our water is safe to drink, recreate in, to support wildlife and plant life, and more is a priority for all of us. And our cities play an essential role in protecting that water through their wastewater treatment systems, through stormwater facilities, and through drinking water systems. But our communities cannot achieve the goal of clean water all on their own. They need the help of the state so that Minnesota can continue forward as a leader on protecting water, and this legislation is designed to do just that. Uh, the handout you received provides some details about the proposal, but I want to share just some of the basics. This bill proposes $299 million to the Public Facilities Authority for three of its programs that provide loans and grants to wastewater and drinking water facilities, with $49 million in state matching funds to access federal money, $100 million for the Water Infrastructure Fund, or WIF, and $150 million for the Point Source Implementation Grant Program, or PSIG. The bill also raises the cap on WIF grants and eliminates it on PSIG grants to provide more funding for each project. The bill also proposes providing more certainty to local governments who must upgrade their facilities to meet water quality standards by providing $75 million per biennium in permanent funding for the PSIG program. Finally, the legislation uh, creates and funds a technical grant program for local governments to develop long-term plans for their wastewater facility facilities and related sewer systems and for their drinking water treatment systems that will allow local governments to address current needs and future challenges and to think creatively about cost-effective solutions. I do have testifiers who will um, talk a little bit more about how this proposal will help our cities as well as promote jobs and economic development. So if I could, Mr. Chair, I'd like to turn it over to Craig Clark, City Manager for the City of Austin. Uh, Mr. Clark, welcome to the committee. Please identify yourself for the record and present your testimony. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair Pulowski and members of the committee. My name is Craig Clark, Administrator for City of Austin. I'm testifying on behalf of the Coalition of Greater Minnesota Cities as one of their board members. Um, unfortunately, we didn't have any props necessarily like Pine Island had. We do want to continue to produce this in Austin and would greatly appreciate your support for that. Um, Minnesota cities do take great pride in helping protect Minnesota waters and doing so is very expensive and we need your help from the state uh, to answer Representative Hamilton and others questions according to MPCA and Minnesota Department of Health. There are $5.3 billion worth of wastewater projects on tap over the next 20 years and 7.5 billion in drinking water projects. And the need continues to grow, which makes PFA funding program this bill so important. Austin, which is number four in the state's clean water priority list, is one of many across the state facing expensive infrastructure projects that could benefit from this legislation. To meet new permit requirements and remove phosphorus, which Austin represents 10% of the overall state's phosphorus load into our waterways and update our aging infrastructure, which major pieces in Austin were date as long ago as 1920 and 1939. 
This project in Austin is $86.2 million. And without financial assistance from the state, this project would cause, cause great hardship for our residents and businesses. Our cities are willing to pay their fair share. And by next year here in Austin, our residents from 2018 will have faced a 75% increase on their wastewater rates. Uh, the PSIG cap at $7 million is really an unfair limitation on a size of community like Austin. We're all Minnesotans and we should all enjoy the same uh, benefit from PFA um, when it comes to uh, these funding sources. Austin, if the $7 million cap were not in place, would be programmatically entitled to $19.8 million. Um, so we feel that that would be fair to have an equal representation uh, for our community as other communities enjoy across the state. Uh, we appreciate the support the legislature has provided for these programs in the past and respectfully ask that you support this legislation. Um, I think I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Thorson to talk about some more of the economic development impacts on jobs uh, to this legislation. Uh, Mr. Clark, uh, for the last 20 years, I've had gatherings in my apartment in St. Paul of Greater Minnesota Legislators. One of the key items has been spam, black pepper spam, sliced thin and grilled. Yes, it that's key. Hors d'oeuvre of those gatherings, and we will continue to use it. So I'll put a plug in for spam too. Black pepper. We appreciate that. I had some this morning as well. So um, please enjoy uh, liberally. All right, Mr. Smith, welcome to the committee. Please identify yourself for the record and present your testimony. Good morning, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Joel Smith. I'm president and business manager for Laguna, Minnesota and North Dakota. We are Minnesota's infrastructure union representing more than 13,000 skilled construction laborers who build and maintain roadways, bridges, and the basic utilities that our communities count on. I'm here today to support House File 3858, a proposal to fix our state's aging municipal infrastructure that is threatening the vitality of our communities, the safety of our drinking water, and the quality of the lakes and rivers we all treasure as Minnesotans. These investments allow communities across the state to repair, repair wastewater treatment plants, stormwater facilities, and drinking water systems that are often at or near capacity or even be at or near the end of their useful life. This is critical infrastructure that allows communities to prepare for severe weather events, clean up existing water contamination, and upgrade facilities to prevent pollution from happening in the first place. I also support this proposal because it will launch and maintain thousands of high quality, family sustaining prevailing wage jobs for tradesmen and women all throughout the state. We are very excited about the career economic inclusion opportunities this will bring to Minnesota's construction industry. The trades are committing more resources and effort than ever to connect women, veterans, people of color, and young people to the promise of great careers in the trades through our registered apprenticeship programs. And we know that a union card and prevailing wage has, and always will be, a ticket to the middle class. You might not get rich, but you will, you will provide for your family, have good health care you can count on, and retire with dignity. Mr. Chair, I want to thank Representative Bolden for bringing forward this proposal, and I strongly encourage members of this committee to support House File 3858 because it will make our communities more resilient and it will create and maintain thousands of family supporting construction careers for people in every corner of our state. Thank you for your time today. Members, any questions? questions on the bill? Uh, thank this you, Mr. Chairman. Representative Hamilton. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, my question is about the, uh, the, the dollar amount. Um, Mr. Clark shared with us what the need is here in the state of Minnesota. Uh, for investment in, this in these type of projects. Um, it looks like that, uh, according to Mr. Clark's numbers, it looks like we are way underfunding the need in this bill. And so my question is, um, where did uh, these dollar amounts come from, if you will, that are in the bill? And should we be investing more money than what we have in here? That's my question, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Clark. Um, is that question directed to me? I believe it was, Mr. Clark. If you're 
can't answer it, that's fine too. I um, Well, the numbers that I provided were from MPCA and the Minnesota Department of Health. But as I understood Mr. Hamilton or Representative Hamilton's question, he was talking specifically about the dollar amount in the legislation itself. So um, perhaps Representative Bolton would uh, field that question. Representative Bolton. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Rep uh, Representative Hamilton, for the question. Um, I can speak a bit to the amount. So uh, the $49 million for the state match is adapted from what the PFA has said that it will need to match the federal funds available this year, and that's what was included in the governor's bonding proposal. Uh, the $100 million for WIF reflects the original amount that was requested by the PFA. Uh, the PFA lowered this amount when it increased the amount needed for the federal match, uh, so the total identified unfunded uh, with needs on the 2022 project priority list are $107 million for drinking water and $87 million for wastewater. Um, and the $150 million for the PSIG reflects uh, two primary considerations. One uh, is our proposal to remove the PSIG cap, and then two is known projects that will likely be requesting PSIG certification in July of 2022. Um, removing the cap will increase the amount needed for projects already on the list. So um, we're also aware of some projects such as the Albert Lee Wastewater Facility um, that'll be requesting certification in July. So combined with the increased um, inflationary costs that we're seeing, an increase in the amount dedicated to PSIG is necessary. Um, and I don't know if there's, uh, if uh, maybe uh, Elizabeth Weffel would want to comment further on that, uh, but that's, that's what I would Let's say. Let's go to Representative Hamilton and see if that answers his questions. Remember, 10 o'clock is when we're ending this committee. Well, so well, Mr. Chairman, I think we have uh, a chance of a lifetime right now to be able to invest the dollars, um, have them available for the projects all across the state of Minnesota. And so I just want to make sure that we are putting in the correct numbers in our bills to move this forward to address the need all across the state. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Representative Hamilton, thank you again for illustrating the purpose of this hearing to address the need. Representative McDonald, your hand is up. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, a question for you or the author uh, regarding the bills. Um, what, the first question is, uh, is the legacy fund, legacy money, is any of that monies going to be used for these clean water projects. Are you aware of that, Mr. Chair? Representative McDonald, I couldn't answer the question, but I would, I would say I, I do, do not think so. This is all, uh, as we've said before, this is coming from one fund we've used, not from the legacy fund, but we'll get that answer to you um, as quickly as we can if we can't answer it today. Thank you, then. And my follow-up question, Mr. Chair? Follow-up. Follow-up. <laughs> Excellent. Um, in speaking with the commissioner uh, of labor and industry, uh, labor, she indicated that uh, they're banking on a $7 billion uh, funding from the Build Back Better. When we don't get that, uh, what happens to these projects? Because uh, I'm under the impression that these projects are uh, very important and I'll support them, but uh, it appears that they may be banking on, since there's a lack of funds, that Build Back Better that is not going to uh, be uh, coming to our state or passing. So uh, thoughts on that, Mr. Chair. Mr. Ch uh, Representative McDonald, that is going to have to be answered at a future date and time. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right, seeing no further discussion, Representative Bolden, last word on your bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, committee members. Um, again, I just thank you for your time um, and appreciate uh, Representative Hamilton's comments about this really is an opportunity and there really are needs across the state. And so um, encourage us to, to be thinking about making these important investments. So thank you so much. I'm renewing my motion that House File 3858 uh, be re-referred to the Capital Investment Committee. The clerk will take the roll. Representative Pulaski. Pulaski votes aye. Representative Pulaski, aye. Representative Sandell. Representative Keel. Keel votes aye. Representative Keel, aye. Representative Bierman. Bierman, aye. Representative Bierman, aye. Representative Bliss. Bliss, aye. Representative Bliss, aye. Representative Burkle. Burkle, aye. Representative Burkle, aye. Representative Frazier. Frazier, aye. Representative Frazier, aye. Representative Hamilton. Hamilton, aye. Representative Hamilton, aye. Representative Bliss Lagarde. Representative Liss Lagarde, aye. Representative Liss Lagarde, aye. Representative McDonald. McDonald, aye. Representative McDonald, aye. Representative Sandstead. 
Sunstead, aye. Representative Sunstead, aye. Representative Sundin. Sundin, aye. Representative Sundin, aye. Representative Sandell. I'm sorry, Mr. Sir, um, Sandell votes aye. Representative Sundell, aye. We have 12 ayes, zero nays. With a vote of 12 to zero, House File 3858 is re-referred to capital investment. There is nothing else on the agenda, but I would like to point out to members, as was stated at the beginning of the committee and by many of you, we have identified a critical need with these bills. We have heard seven bills today, seven, four of them Republican, three of them DFL. They all passed unanimously. The need is there. There is unanimous support by Republicans and Democrats to address the need. So the point of the committee, I think, has been made. I want to thank the members and also the presenters. And Representative Keel, you have a question? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate that. I just wanted to ask you if you could follow up on, uh, certainly this is important work we did today. Uh, have you any idea where, where we will be headed in the next few weeks uh, by any chance? I do know there was a meeting of <laughs> Jeremy Miller uh, Melissa Hartman and the governor yesterday. And I'm hoping that we will find out from those three where we will be going soon. Okay. So we may or may not be meeting next week. Uh, it, that depends on certain things being agreed to with spending bills. As, as the members have seen this session, we are not going to do omnibus bills. We're going to do separate bills. Those will be separate targets that will be assigned in ways and means. This is a little bit different session. So as those separate items are agreed to, we can then move them forward. For instance, broadband. When there's agreement on broadband, we'll move that bill separately forward. If there's agreement on disaster aid, we'll move that separately forward. But until there is agreement, we really can't do much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just appreciate your update on where we're headed. That's as much as, we know. <laughs> much as I know, Representative Keel. Thank you, members. And with that, meeting is adjourned.